Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We bow our heads to pray. Lord, bless the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts. May they be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Dear friends, in Jesus, our Savior, who died and rose again. I was 10 years old when I first experienced it. I had been playing out in the backyard, and I walked into our house and into the kitchen where I could see my mom had been talking to my brother. And I didn't know what they had been talking about, but I could tell from my brother's misty eyes and his quivering chin, the telltale signs that something was wrong. And so I looked at mom, and she said, Grandpa Bitter died of a sudden heart attack this morning. And that's when death changed for me. It changed from being an abstract idea that that other people had to deal with to being an unwelcome intrusion on my life that I had to face. And funeral arrangements were made, and it was time to go visit Grandma. And so we pulled up to her house, and we filed into her home. And I wondered what I was going to say to her as she stood there greeting our family one by one with hugs and with tears. What could I say to encourage her and to hold out hope? You know what I said? Nothing. Nothing. I just cried and gave her a hug. I was 10 years old. Chances are you've been in a situation like that, maybe not at 10 years old, but at some time in your life. And you can recall fellow Christians whom you knew and who you loved, who died. And you've attended funerals and you've visited families and the survivors you ever struggled with what to say at a funeral? How to encourage and to hold out hope? The Apostle Paul helps us with that this morning. As he wrote to the Christians in the city of Thessalonica about Christian loved ones who had died, he gives us words of hope that we can use to encourage one another. There are a lot of things that people can live without, but we can't live without hope. You can take away the car and you'll get along. That's what buses are for and Uber. You can foreclose on your home and life will still go on. You can even lose your cell phone. Yes, your cell phone and you probably are able to manage. But take away hope and you have lost everything. The people to whom Paul first wrote these words were a small group of believers in a small mission church in a large city of about 200,000 people. And these Christians struggled daily to build their lives on the hope of Jesus Christ in the midst of an unbelieving society. And they were under severe pressure. They were outnumbered and they were persecuted and they suffered every day just for their faith in Jesus. But that's not what what threatened to steal the hope from their hearts. What threatened to steal their hope were the funerals. When Paul visited them on his missionary journey, he had taught these Christians the basics of the Christian faith which culminates in the glorious return of Jesus Christ on the last day, where he will gather up his believers and take them to be with him in heaven. And they looked forward with joy to that day. But there seemed to be a problem. Moms in the congregation were getting cancer. And brothers were suddenly being killed in tragic accidents. Grandmas and grandpas were expiring from old age. People were dying off before that big day, and they wondered, were they going to miss out on that glorious return and that victory? 
That thought, more than the persecution, is what threatened to steal hope from their hearts. And so Paul gave them words of hope. Words of hope about a situation that seems to be probably the most hopeless situation we can ever find ourselves in. The death of a loved one. Paul begins by clearing up confusion. He says, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Notice that Paul doesn't say don't cry at the death of a Christian friend. He doesn't say, we don't want you to grieve as if death isn't sad. Jesus cried at the death of his friend Lazarus. It's not wrong for you to cry too. Even for Christians, death brings tremendous grief. Walking past her bedroom that's been untouched since the day that she was taken away, regularly sleeping alone for the first time in decades, trying to learn how to live in a quiet house that was once filled with his voice. It's all kinds of things that trigger the grief to come rushing back. So Paul acknowledges the pain that's associated with death because that pain is very, very real. But he didn't want these Christians to grieve without hope. And that's why he didn't say that their loved ones had just died. And he didn't say that their loved ones had just passed away and they ceased to exist. But on multiple times he said that they fell asleep. And isn't that a wonderful thought? Who here doesn't like sleeping? I don't hear many people complaining to me. I got too much sleep last night. And we like taking naps. But the problem is, when that sleep is over, we wake up and life hasn't changed. The bills are still on the table. The aches and the arthritis are still there. The kids are still crying. We're still living in a sinful and a fallen world as sinful and fallen people. But when a believer in Jesus falls asleep in death, he doesn't wake up to problems, but to paradise. He closes his eyes one day in one world, and he opens them up the next in another with the Lord. Paul shared words of hope with these Christians by reminding them that faith in Jesus Christ means that death doesn't have the last word. The believer, for the believer, death is not a period, but it's a comma. It's not an eternal ending, but rather it's like falling asleep and waking up to a new day, and a better day, and a perfect day. But even more than that, Paul had more words of hope. Remember that these Christians were looking forward to Jesus coming back in glory on that last day. And they were worried that their Christian loved ones were somehow going to miss out on that great event. And so Paul shared some details about that day. He said, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. It's going to be the loudest and the most effective alarm clock that this world has ever heard. A command and a voice and a trumpet blast loud enough and powerful enough literally to wake the dead. And if these Christians in Thessalonica were worried about their Christian loved ones who had died, Paul put their worries to rest. They weren't going to miss a thing. And in fact, the entire second coming of Christ will begin with them. The command of the Lord will thunder across every cemetery on the earth and call Christians forth from their graves, and they will be raised with glorious bodies. 
And the voice of the archangel will command his angel armies to gather up all of his believers to himself. They won't miss out on a thing. And even better, you'll stop missing them. After that, we who are still alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Would you agree that death is probably the hardest on the people who don't die? It's knowing that you're going to be separated from your loved one. You're not going to be able to talk to them anymore. You're not going to be able to hear their voice again. Before we moved here to Milwaukee four years ago, we would only come here occasionally to visit. And the purpose of that visit was to see my sister, who had been diagnosed with cancer, and she was very sick. And the last time that we came, we knew it was going to be the last time that we would see her and be able to talk to her. It's an eight and a half hour drive from Fargo, North Dakota to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Lots of time to think. What do you say to your sister in a situation like that? I don't remember everything that was said that day, but I do remember the last conversation. Lynn, I love you. I'll miss you. But I know I'll see you again. And she said, I know, I'll miss you too, and it's going to be so great. We will be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Now that's a word that brings hope. It's a word that means that even the most difficult life and even the most trying circumstances that seem like they're forever are only like a centimeter on the yardstick of eternity. And it means that those who have struggled and those who have fought, those who have cried and wept and grieved but have held on to their hope in Jesus will enter into an existence that will be far beyond anything they ever could have imagined and it will never end. And we will forget the most painful moments when Jesus returns and paradise begins. There are a lot of things that we can live without but we can't live without hope. It's been said that hope always has an object and an expectation. You are always hoping in something and you are asking that something to deliver something to you. That's what hope is. And everything that the Apostle Paul wrote to the Christians in Thessalonica, everything that we've talked about this morning, is anchored in a certain object and expectation. It's the focus of our Christian funerals. It's the center of our worship services and it's the foundation of the Christian faith. Paul said, we believe that Jesus died and he rose again. Jesus died and we know why. He died on the cross because he was guilty of sin that he took from you and from me and made his very own. And in our place he was condemned and he sealed our forgiveness with his blood. And we believe that Jesus rose again. And we know why it happened. It's because he won the victory. Sin was no match for him. He paid for it. Death couldn't hold him. He rose from it. And he shares that victory with you and me as he proclaims you innocent in the eyes of God and heirs of eternal life. When you stand at the bedside of a loved one who is drifting away from you into eternity, and when you are making preparations and plans for a funeral and your heart is broken, 
When you walk away from the graveside and you have this empty feeling inside, that is your hope. The cross and the empty tomb of Jesus Christ is a symbol of our redemption, and it's a guarantee that our struggles are not eternal. Only our victory is. Therefore, Paul says, encourage one another with these words. And that's what we're doing here. God has given us to each other so that we can encourage one another with words of hope. So that like the five wise virgins in the gospel reading who were ready and waiting for Jesus when he returned, we will have our lamps filled and burning brightly as we believe the good news that Jesus has prepared an eternal wedding feast for us through his death and resurrection. He's invited you to it at your baptism. He encourages you to be ready for it through his word. He gives you a foretaste of it in his supper so that no matter how difficult life becomes, you can always say, hope has invaded my life in the person of Jesus Christ. I think that I have attended and presided over more than 50 funerals since my first funeral when I went to my grandpa's funeral. And you'd think death would get a little easier after all that time. But it's still hard. As Christians, we contemplate death and dying, and sometimes we wonder, and sometimes we weep. But we do not have to grieve as those who have no hope because we believe and we know that Jesus died and rose again. And so we can be content and we can be confident. We can even be courageous as we hold on to the hope that we have in Jesus and as we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come with the sound of crying and weeping will be heard no more. Amen.